chapter 2.4, video part 4, we're in sculpture. We looked over lost wax casting, and we looked at um, the race warrior. So this is a kind of a, um, there's some diagrams in the book, or there's some sort of charts. Uh, page 250 and 251 are really great for kind of breaking down different materials and how they relate to uh, the methods. So beyond traditional methods, um, you know, for thousands and tens of thousands of years, people have been doing carving and modeling and, um, <clears throat> you know, and then later uh, bronze casting, which happened, you know, um, quite a bit later. But then we get into the modern world, and this is going to go in the deep past a little bit too, but, but once we have all these new materials, new manufacturing, then we get into some other um, materials. So earthworks, um, it is kind of like a giant outdoor sculpture or a uh, land mass. What this is, what they are, I should say, earthworks evolved out of the minimalism uh, period in the in the late '60s, early '70s, where they were feeling that they wanted to get away from purchasable artworks and they wanted to have something that was monumental and outside of the gallery. So two important things, not able to purchase it, it's outside of a gallery, and um, those would be sort of the reasonings, but they wanted something that was going to be enormous and also uh, be out in the world. Now this is an ancient earthwork that is almost 3,000 years old in Ohio. So what the minimalists are doing is that they're hearkening back to uh, the ancient world and thinking about you know um, this, these ancient constructs of, of earth and the patterns and designs that they made. So if you look here, we have this spiral here. This is 3,000 years ago in Ohio. And then we move forward into 1970 in the Great Salt Lake. Uh, Robert Smithson makes the spiral jetty. And basically this is made by the local materials and a bulldozer, he just takes a bulldozer, pushes it there, comes back, pushes it there, flattens it out, and then goes a little further, a little further, and then makes this spiral. This is underwater at times because it's the edge of a lake, and then other times it's more exposed, like this. And that was part of the intent, was to interact with nature. Construction, when we think about construction, it's a pretty broad um, category. Uh, specifically, there were constructivists in the Soviet uh, constructivists in the early 20th century, um, but the idea of putting together components, um, <clears throat> this is a welded piece of flat planes of steel, and this is a manufactured material, so that's part of how materials start to change. This is 100 years old plus, 104 years old. 1916, but we have welded flattened steel now, and sculptors are experimenting with existing manufactured materials. This is 1916, and then the minimalists go further with it in 1960. So about 50 years later, we see some of these minimalists pick up some of these ideas that uh, were explored, but not really fully, you know, ex not fully explored at that time. So this is a, <clears throat> a constructivist artist, Gabo, and he is more interested in the interior construction than the exterior surface. So if you think about um, how the, the, the volumes were constructed, we don't have a skin on top of this. That's basically what that's saying, and that it's showing the sort of bones underneath. Damien Hirst, this is much more modern, 1991. Um, and this is really a more conceptual piece, although it is constructed and then filled with water and it had to be very specific aquarium glass and formaldehyde and it had to be uh, well done. Now, they, he didn't really know what he was doing and um, over time the shark uh, fell apart and dis disintegrated and he had to re-pickle uh, a shark, find a new shark and do the whole thing over again. But anyway... This is full of water, it's a permanent sculpture, and it is moved around and shown quite frequently. 
Assemblage is another mode of working. So when you think about construction, you're pulling together materials, and that usually refers to like welded metal and 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 uh, lumber, that kind of thing. But when you're getting into assemblage, you're getting into found objects. And what found objects are, they're sort of um, the things that we are throwing away as people and also as manufacturing uh, waste as well. So their first example here is Betty Saar. She's a, actually a Los Angeles artist. Uh, and her daughter, Allison Saar, actually both her daughters are artists as well. Leslie Saar. Um, but this is sort of going from Joseph Cornell, which we don't really look at in this semester, but this is a box, and then she's putting a figure, um, the Aunt Jemima figure in here, and then some Aunt Jemima labels from um, uh, syrup. There used to be this lady's face in the 70s, and this is 1972. For many years, there was an Aunt Jemima uh, face put onto syrup, so it's kind of referencing um, mammies and referencing, um, you know, uh, servants and then back behind that slavery and so on. So she's taking a different take on this. She's putting in a, a black power fist from the, um, <clears throat> time period 72. And she's also putting a gun into, to mammy's hand, Aunt Jemima's hand and, uh, changing the, uh, the narrative there. So it's kind of interesting. She's exploring some identity themes here. Ready-mades, this is where this found object thing comes from. It comes from Duchamp. Duchamp originates many, many things. He re originates uh, ready-mades, kinetic work, um, conceptualism, appropriation, although he is not a conceptual artist. So you want to make a distinction of what he actually is versus what he influenced. Now, a lot of other, um, other isms or a lot of other categories grandfathered him in because he was such a heavy influence. Um, so we're going to look at <clears throat> an appropriation, I'm oh, sorry, we're going to look at a uh, assemblage piece. This is found object. So these are some bicycle handles and this is a bicycle seat. This is Picasso. Picasso is imitating Duchamp. Duchamp is from the teens and 20s, which Picasso is too. They're, they're contemporaries. They're about the same age. Um, but Picasso likes this idea that Duchamp comes up with and makes a piece that looks like a bull's head out of found materials that have nothing to do with uh, normal sculpture. Kinetic and light sculpture. So kinetic sculpture, that's also one of Duchamp's inventions, things that move. Okay, It's the same as kinesiology, it's movement. Lighted wor work is light sculpture. There's a di couple different categories of that. George Rickey. This is called the braking column. Some of his are motorized, but some of them are wind or motion driven uh, or even sun driven sometimes, but I think mostly his are wind driven. So the wind would blow this and this might spin around. If you if you look back in 1986, um, he's still in that mode of constructing with welded aluminum. He's taking uh, manufactured aluminum and, or sorry, stainless steel and he's welding it together and it's a kinetic piece. Maholo Negi, uh, this is a really important piece and it's a light prop for an electric stage. So this thing is kind of looks like a kitchen gadget but what it is, and it probably has some kitchen gadget pieces in it. This is a found object piece but it's a functional piece where for theater uh, design he came up with this thing to do light and noise and all kinds of things um, and he was a, a really interesting artist, and this is early, very early 1929, early 20th century. It became the main character in the film by the artist. Okay, so a, a motor is going to move a series of perforated discs that cross in front of a light. Installation work. Uh, installation work is similar to earthworks in the sense that they're very large and that you get inside of them and you interact with them in a physical way. So this particular piece is a light piece, so it's covering two categories. It's an installation and a light piece, and um, you're walking around it and interacting with it. Uh, it's not giving us how high it is, but it's quite tall. But this is a light piece, and also you're interacting and getting near it. 
The last thing we're going to look at is Anthony Gormley's Asian Field, and you do have a, a essay question, I believe, on this. Um, but these are clay pieces that he made, and he he asked for a lot of people to come in this village and to make similar figures, and then to fill up this entire space. So this is installation work. Uh, Anne Hamilton is the premier installation artist in the world. And this is similar to something she would do where she would just cover an entire floor with a repeating object and it would just be a, a very intense area. So this is a warehouse um, in, in uh, it says former Shanghai number 10 Steelworks China, China. But it's really speaking to the massiveness of people. And I'm going to let you read more on the intent of this, but the visual aspect of it is overwhelming and it, it fills a whole room. Now, often with installation, you can walk like there's a pathway through something or there's sort of a, 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 a walkway around it or you stand in the middle and there's all these other things happening. Um, Yoyoi Kusama does that where you walk into a room and then you're in there by yourself. So there's different ways that installations are formed. This one we can only view from this doorway here.